My name's John, I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary, my family, and I normally worship in Boulder, but I love getting to visit our other campuses and see so many old friends that I love and meet new ones too. So I'm glad you are here today with us. We've been in a series this summer that we've called Formed because we recognize and realize that we are all being shaped by something, influenced by someone formed into the people that we are. And as followers of Jesus, we want most of all to be shaped and formed by him. We want to hear his voice most loudly and clearly in our life over all the other voices we can listen to. And so we've been looking at a series of habits, practices, disciplines that have defined Christians throughout history that have helped them by the power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit to be more and more conformed, transformed into the image of Jesus. The discipline or practice we're going to look at today, I think, is one that we admire most in the lives of other people. We love it when people express this discipline. Even better if we're a part of their close circle of friends or maybe most of all if they're a part of our family. It's the habit of generosity. Generous people are the best, aren't they? They seem so happy, at ease. It's a joy to be around generous people. When you do a quick Google search for the world's most generous people, the names you find on the list aren't all that surprising. Names you probably would expect and are familiar with. Names like Gates and Bezos Zuckerberg and Buffett. My favorite link, though, on that search list is the third or fourth one, which is, uh, takes you to an article that's entitled, The World's Most Generous People and How to Contact Them. <laughs> I see you all grabbing your cell phones to find that list. It's funny, though, when you think about it, that if you do a Google search for the world's most generous people and then do a Google search for the world's wealthiest people, the names are the same. That's the way the world thinks about generosity. We like to define it by an amount. So therefore, if you're the wealthiest person in the world and you give a lot of money away, therefore, you must be the most generous. But the Bible thinks about generosity differently. The Bible doesn't talk about generosity and define it by an amount, but rather by an attitude. And we're going to spend some time together in the scriptures today looking at a particular attitude of generosity from the first century church. So if you have yours with you, open your Bible with me to the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. If you're new to the Bible, the New Testament is roughly the second half of the book. It begins with four biographies of Jesus of Nazareth, which detail the historical account of his birth and life and ministry and eventual death and resurrection. Those biographies, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are called the Gospels. Then they're followed by the early history of the New Testament church in the book of Acts, and then begins a series of letters written by the Apostle Paul to a number of uh, early churches. The first one is to the church in Rome, and then you'll see two letters to the church in Corinth. We're in the second one. 2 Corinthians 8, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, 
but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Let's spend a few moments looking at the first two verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, which sort of set the context for us. Paul is writing to the church in the city of Corinth. Corinth was an amazing city in the first century. It was artistic, it was diverse, it was influential. There were many successful businesses there. So it was an affluent city, intellectual, smart, filled with people who were capable confident. It's kind of surprising that an influential, affluent, educated people would need a reminder to be generous, especially when you compare them with the Macedonians. Macedonia was a region that was north of Corinth, filled with churches and cities that you may have heard of if you're familiar with the Bible, churches like Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. And the Macedonians were a little bit different in their context than the Corinthians were. In fact, if you look closely at verse 2, you'll see what Paul says as he describes the churches there. He says that in a severe test of affliction that had come to the Macedonians, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Isn't it surprising that a region that Paul says was afflicted and impoverished, would also be filled with joy and generosity. That's an interesting combination that we might not readily expect. But again, the Bible doesn't think about generosity as an amount, but rather as an attitude. And I think that was the key and the example that Paul uses throughout his teaching to the Corinthians is this attitude of joy and generosity that defined the Macedonians. Friends, I know when we talk about money, generosity, and church, it can feel awkward. My goal today is not to burden you. My goal today is not to guilt you. In fact, this is a guilt-free zone. My hope for you today, for each and every one of us, is that if you walk away with one thing from today's message, it is this, that a generous life is a joyful life. The Macedonians experienced it, even in spite of their poverty. They experienced joy as they gave. And I think that's what God calls each and every one of us to step into, as we practice this habit of generosity in our life, not only with our resources, but also with our time, with the ways that God has gifted us. Because a generous life is a joyful life. In fact, Jesus himself said that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Sure, we've all heard that before. And maybe if we're honest, when we hear that, we think, I'm not really sure if that's completely true. Because it is a joy to receive good gifts, isn't it? Maybe you've received an especially generous gift in your life and you loved it. It's a beautiful expression of love to you. But Jesus said it's, it's better. It is blessed could be translated happy. It is happier to give than to receive. Your life will be happier and more full if you make generosity a regular part of it. If you're a parent, I think you can watch this as you get to see your kids give you gifts. My youngest son, Beckett, just wrapped up third grade, and before the school year was over, his class did a project together. They made Father's Day gifts for all the dads. There was about a month or so that uh, separated the end of school before Father's Day happened, and I, I can't tell you how many times in that month, after school was over and before Father's Day, Beckett would say something to me like this, Dad. I made an awesome Father's Day gift for you. You're going to love it. I hid it somewhere in the house. You can't look for it. You can't try to guess what it is. And you're not allowed to ask mom about it. But you are going to love it. 
And I got to watch for that whole month, my son Beckett, 10 years old, experience the joy of giving. He was so excited to give that simple gift to me. And I loved it. I treasured it. I absolutely appreciated receiving it. It meant so much to me, but I'm certain that that month-long experience for Beckett was one of joy. As he experienced this reality, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Maybe you've received a gift from your child where you've really seen this. You know, sometimes... They give you what they think is a flower, but it's actually a weed. (laughs) But they love to give it to you, right? Or they bring home a sculpture from school that they insist is a perfect depiction of some kind of animal. You can't quite discern exactly what it is, but you're glad to receive it. But they love to give it to you, don't they? It is more blessed to give than to receive. A team of social scientists from the University of Notre Dame, Christian Smith and Hillary Davidson have studied the idea that it's better to give than to receive. They published their findings in a book called The Paradox of Generosity. Their study proved scientifically that giving money, volunteering, being relationally generous, being a generous neighbor and friend, and personally valuing the importance of being a generous person are all significantly positively correlated with greater personal happiness, physical health, a stronger sense of purpose in life, avoidance of symptoms of depression, and a greater interest in personal growth. Being generous is a good way to live. Randy Alcorn is a Christian author, and he's written a number of books about the topic of generosity. In his most recent one, Giving is the Good Life, he says this, surprisingly, The Bible doesn't talk much about how giving changes the lives of its recipients. More often, it talks about what giving does for the one who gives. So I think Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. When I think about Jesus and the habit of generosity, what I find most fascinating is that I believe, I hope you would agree with me, that Jesus is the most generous man who ever lived. But he didn't have a lot of money. I think there's a lot we can learn from the life of Jesus about generosity. Paul uses him as an example in verse 9 of our text when he says, for you Corinthians... Know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God, left the glory and the splendor and the richness of heaven to come to earth for you. He lived a remarkably humble life. He was born a helpless baby. He lived a simple, humble life. He said of himself, the son of man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. And then he died a humiliating death for you. He became poor so that you might become rich. Now, let's be careful not to interpret this verse as some sort of prosperity gospel, health and wealth kind of verse. That's not what Paul is talking about. He is talking about the kind of spiritual poverty that Jesus experienced, leaving heaven and coming to earth and living that humble and then ultimately dying a humiliating death. That's the kind of spiritual poverty that Jesus experienced so that each and every one of you might experience a kind of spiritual richness that is mind-blowing, beyond description, that you might inherit eternal life. If you believe by faith in the name of Jesus Christ, you might live forever with him in the glory and the splendor and the richness of heaven that he left for you. Now, while I absolutely think Paul is thinking about that eternal 
inheritance that each believer in Jesus Christ will receive. I think he also has in his mind an idea of the kind of richness we could experience here on the earth. And again, not monetary, not, not monetarily, but there is a richness and abundance and fullness and blessing that is experienced when we follow the model of Jesus in the way that he humbled himself, gave of his time, gave of his giftings, gave of his resources for the good of others. And if we follow that example, we get to experience a kind of richness and abundance here in our life today. That's what God is calling each of us into. Let's think for a few moments then about the generous life of our Savior. He was so generous with his time. Think about the ways in which he was so intentional. He may have been on his way to preach to hundreds of people, but that wouldn't stop him from meeting the needs of a person along the way, having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who other people wouldn't even speak to. There were no prerequisites in the life of Jesus for him to be able to spend time with you. You didn't have to be on the inside. You didn't even have to believe in Jesus for him to heal you or come alongside you or help you. He often spent time having a meal with people who were his enemies, who ultimately conspired to have him executed. Jesus was so generous with his time. Think about the ways in which Jesus was extraordinarily generous with the ways that he was uniquely gifted by God to do things that no one else could do. I think of the feeding of the 5,000, how Jesus took a small number of loaves of bread and a few fish and multiplied it to feed 5,000 people. Now, when we hear that story, we often get caught up in the miraculous nature of what occurred. And we ought to. It demonstrates the power and the authority and the uniqueness of Jesus Christ that he could do what no other human being who had ever walked the earth could do. God himself demonstrating his power. But think about the generous act of mercy that the feeding of the 5,000 was. He was teaching a crowd for several hours. And I guess his message went a little long because they hadn't had time for lunch. And he looked over the crowd and the Bible says he felt compassion for them because they were hungry. Now, this wasn't like starvation hunger. It just had been a couple hours since their previous meal. But Jesus saw they had a need that he was uniquely gifted to meet. And he generously gave lunch to thousands of people. Jesus is the most generous man who ever lived. So generous with his time, so generous with his giftings, so generous that he would leave heaven and come to earth for you so that you might experience life with him. Later in his book, Randy Alcorn says, so if you're a Christian and you're searching for the good life, you don't have to go far to find it. Look no further than Jesus. Know him, delight in him, serve him, learn from his people and do what he says. There is no better life than that. A generous life is a joyful life. So how might we all think about increasing generosity in our own lives? I wanna give you three rhythms of generous Christians. We'll run through them quickly and then we'll spend a little time on each of them. The three rhythms I see in the life of generous Christians are these. First, they prioritize generosity. Then they pray about generosity. And finally, they practice generosity regularly. So how do generous Christians prioritize generosity? Well, look at what Paul says to the Corinthians in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 8. He says to them, you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Paul says, Corinthians, you are so good at so many things. You have deep faith. You're good speakers. You're knowledgeable about the scriptures and the faith. You're earnest and committed to your faith. You excel, you prioritize, to use a different word, 
in all of those areas, I want to see you prioritize this area also too, in this act of grace, which is the habit of generosity. Excel in this also. Generous Christians prioritize generosity. Now, one way Christians throughout history have made generosity a priority is by thinking about a percentage of their income that they give on a regular basis. I think this is a good way, a healthy way to think about making that a priority in each of our lives. What I would say, and just a bit of a caution around that, what we don't want to get caught up in is the idea that if I give X percentage away, then the rest is for me, right? Because here's what I think that generous Christians have realized. They've realized there isn't a portion of their income that's set apart for God and the rest is for them. They realize that all we have belongs to God. Everything. Not X percentage, 100%. God's given us life. He gives us breath. He gives us so much, the ability to work. He gives us resources. He gives us food. He gives us clothing, a place to live. He gives us friends and family. He has given us his one and only son. And so all we have belongs to God. Let's jump to the Old Testament for a minute in Psalm 24, famous psalm written by David. The first two verses begin this way. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in the earth belongs to God. The world and those who dwell therein, for God has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. All that we have belongs to God. I think that's the first step in prioritizing generosity in each of our lives is a simple recognition that everything is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I think this is an important decision for each of us to make and a realization for us to come to because the truth is God doesn't need our money. He has everything that he needs. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God doesn't need or want our money. What he is most interested in is our hearts. That's what he's after. That's what God cares about. That's why it's estimated that nearly 25% of the messages that Jesus preached centered around money. One out of every four sermons that Jesus gave were about this topic. So we've just decided once a month at Calvary we're going to uh, preach about money. How does that sound to you? Last week at the Boulder campus when I said that, someone said, what Sunday is that going to be? I assume that's because they wanted to make sure they were there when we preached about it. Isn't that amazing? One out of every four sermons that Jesus preached were about this topic. Why do you think that is? I think it's because of what Jesus himself said, that where your treasure is, there your heart is also. He knew how critical this would be for us as we grapple with how to live day to day with the pressures and the world around us telling us certain things about money, and the Bible having an altogether different perspective. So generous Christians prioritize generosity. What are a couple of ways we might be able to tangibly do that in each of our own lives? I think most of all, many of us need to simply create margin in our life so generosity can happen. Maybe that means paying down some debt, selling a car, making some financial decisions that are a little bit different that allow us the freedom and flexibility to be able to regularly give. Thinking about our schedule so that time can be open and available for other people. Doing an inventory in our own life of the ways that God has gifted us and how we might be able to use those gifts for the good and blessing of other people. There often is so little margin, whether it's time or financial in our life, that it can be difficult for us to give. Some of us have an experience where we've made financial decisions, where we look at our current reality and say, it just feels impossible for me to be able to give. That's where I think the 
Second rhythm of a generous Christian might be of help to you. First, they prioritize generosity, and then generous Christians pray about generosity. Even if it's like, God, I I don't see a way for me to be generous. I need your help. That's a good place to start, to ask God to step in and, and help you figure out ways you might be able to allocate your time or your resources to be able to live generously. Another psalm, Psalm 119 and verse 36, has this prayer from the psalmist. Incline my heart to your testimonies, O God, and not to selfish gain. I think we all know that the normal, standard inclination of our hearts is to selfish gain. And we have to ask God to help us, to release us from that. And the way we do that is we pray and ask God, incline my heart to yours. Line my heart up with what is true, God. Not what the world says, not what I see happening in my neighborhood or on television, but line my heart up with yours, God. Speak truth into me so that I wouldn't be inclined to selfish gain, but so that I would follow your model and your example of the way I ought to live. And we pray about this on a regular basis and just ask God, for his help. Lindsay and I had an experience right before we were married where we needed God's help in our finances so that we could create margin in our life to be able to be generous. One night, I think we were doing our uh, premarital assignment from Pastor Tom to create a budget. And when we looked at it, we realized that some things weren't going to add up after we became married. We were making plans to move in together after our wedding and uh, had signed a lease on an apartment and we had our separate places where we were living before. Lindsay was living in a house and I was living in a condo and she had found someone to take over her lease in her house and I had been working really hard to find someone who could take over the lease in my condo. And as we were doing this budget homework together, we realized that there was going to be, if I couldn't find someone to step into my lease in my condo, we were going to have a four-month overlap where we were going to have to pay two rent payments a month. We were young, 24, we were making 12 bucks an hour and it just didn't add up. There was no way it would be possible for us to pay two rent payments for the first four months of being married. And it felt scary. And we felt desperate. And we didn't know what to do. And we said, one night, we just need to pray about this. So we prayed a super simple prayer, not deeply theological. Mostly it was, God, we need help. We don't know what to do. We did know, though, and we said, God, we want to honor you with our finances. But we've made some decisions, and we just look at these numbers, and there's not margin for us to be able to do that. Help. That was it. The next morning, I got a phone call from my landlord who said, I have some bad news. We've run into a position in our own life where we need to sell your condo. And we would like to ask you to move out four months earlier than the end of your lease. The day before our new lease began on our apartment that we would move into. She's apologizing profusely on the phone. I interrupted her in the midst of her apology and said, true story, don't apologize, this is an answer to prayer. Awkward silence. (laughs) After she collected herself, she said, I'm sorry, what did you say? I said, it's too much to go into, but my fiance and I had a financial need and we asked God for help and this meets it perfectly. I would be delighted (laughs) to amend my lease and move out on April 30th. That's been a story that Lindsay and I have clung to and leaned on and remembered throughout our marriage as evidence of of God helping us. And our financial world is much different today than it was nearly 25, 20 years ago. God's been extraordinarily kind to us. But we've always remembered that God has helped us in unique ways. And I'm confident God will help you, even if you find yourself in a desperate situation like we did. So generous Christians prioritize, pray about, and practice 
generosity. Near the end of his teaching about generosity, Paul says this to the Corinthians in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he or she has decided in his or her heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Again, guilt-free zone. God loves a cheerful giver. This is not a command. Not asking you to give under compulsion or reluctantly. Do what God has called you to do in your own heart. But I think a, a regular rhythm in the life of a generous Christian is that they practice the habit of generosity. It happens on a regular basis. It's not random. It's not sporadic. It's not every once in a while when they hear about a need but they practice it regularly. The language that Paul uses is a first century agricultural idea that whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. I think what Paul's trying to describe here is that if this is just kind of a random, sporadic occurrence in your life, you won't experience the joy and abundance and blessing that God promises to those who are regularly generous. You don't get to experience the joy of giving if it doesn't happen regularly. But if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. If this is a habit in your life, a discipline that happens on a regular basis, you will get to experience the reality that a generous life is a joyful life. I loved seeing so many examples of generous living a few weeks ago on each of our campuses during Kids Week. We saw hundreds of volunteers who gave selflessly and generously of their time that week. Stories of people who took time off from work so they could serve at Kids Week and tell kids in Erie and Boulder and Thor Thornton that God loves them and that Jesus came for them. What an awesome expression of generously using time for the good of others. We saw so many people who stepped in and used their unique giftedness to serve the needs of kids that week. People who are excellent at teaching and leading worship and running games and helping to be one-on-one -on -one with kids and doing crafts and decorating and the most important job of all, making snacks. <laughs> so many ways that people used their gifts. And then at each of our campuses, we asked our kids to contribute financially to important projects that would help meet needs in our community. And it was so fun to watch the excitement and enthusiasm that they felt as they set up lemonade stands and did extra chores at home and were able to generously give. And when we met our goals at each of our campuses, the kids celebrated and went crazy because it's a joy to give. And I love that we help kids experience that joy at a young age. Friends, the reason why we're in this series is because each and every one of us is being formed and shaped by something or someone, shaped by our experiences and influences in the world. And we live in a society that looks at money and says, spend it all, leverage it so you can get more, put it away for yourself, enjoy it, gamble it, mortgage it, charge it. And if we're not careful, we will be influenced by that culture and shaped and formed by the world's ideas. But the antidote to that is generosity. And it's a habit that has to be practiced and cultivated and developed, or we will inevitably be formed by the world that, we're, that we live in. Arthur Brooks is an author and professor at Harvard where he writes on and studies happiness. He writes, our brains are actually wired to serve others. When we give charitable money and service to others, our brain releases several stress hormones, which elevate our mood and cause us to feel happy. Serving and giving help to others makes us happier, healthier, more prosperous, and therefore greatly blessed and more successful than non-givers. Practicing generosity regularly is good for you. 
when we prioritize, pray about, and practice generosity regularly, I think most of all, we get to experience and demonstrate God's heart for generosity, which is at his absolute core. Our God is the most generous being in the universe. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Our God is a giver, and he invites each and every one of us into a generous, joyful life as we give freely to others. Let's pray. Our Father, you have been so kind to us. You've given us so much. Life, possessions, You've provided all that we need. Most of all, you have given us your one and only son, Jesus. God, we deserve nothing, and you have given us everything. We pray for your help, God, to develop this habit of generosity in a greater measure in each of our own lives. I pray you help us see what ways we might do that, what ways we might step into serving with our time or with our giftedness or giving generously of our resources for your glory and for the good of people. We bless you, God, for the joy that it is to follow your example of generosity. We pray that it would be used for your glory and for the good of people. We pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.